happy Saturday and welcome to my live stream, Suzanne Off the Cuff, with my special guest over here, Alastair. And we're going to be talking about double knitting today. And as you know, you get to make comments and you can uh, ask questions. If you want to ask a question, please put the word QUESTION in all caps at the beginning of your comment. It makes it easier for me to find it in the chat over there. And then uh, I'll pop it in and everybody can see it. I also have a few questions from people from Ravelry already, and I'll be addressing those with Alistair as well. So welcome, Alistair. It's so good to see you. It's so fun. Well, thank you. I'm glad to finally be on this. Yeah. So um, I'm going to start out just by saying hello to some of the people who are on here. And cool. um, Evelyn. Evelyn's from Bakersfield, where I live. Bonnie Davis. Bonnie, where are you from? Loetta Hendricks from Missouri. Margo's from Bakersfield. Ronnie Shane. Um, Rona Shane, I don't know where she is. Sylvia Earl is from Cameron Park, California. Joy is from Pennsylvania. Dolise is from Washington. Francoise is from Lyon, France. Ooh. Elizabeth Neeson is from Sweden. Um, Nancy Porter, where are you from, Nancy? And Kathy, Katharina Continental is from Berlin, Germany. Um, Teresa is from Maryland. Susan from Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, Deborah Cisnero, she has to tell me. Marlene's from Pittsburgh. Uh, Monterey is Vicky. Amber Shiwi's from Germany. Uh, Michaud Diane is from Montreal. Serena from Florida. Kelly from New Hampshire. Kathy Trakowska from Australia. Hopefully you're staying out of those horrible, horrible fires. Um, Leslie Dunn, Fort Bragg. Leslie, I didn't realize you lived in Fort Bragg. I love that place. <laughs> um, MS Noodle Chil Nook Chili is from Chile, Chile. I don't know if I'm saying that cor correctly. MK from Brooklyn. Bonnie's from Maryland. David Hensley from Western North Carolina. And he says it's sunny there. Nancy Porter from Washington. Viviets from Ireland. And Sung Park from Chicago. And there'll be a lot more people on here. They're just oh, I'm sure. Right so there's people from all over the world. And, yeah, great uh, crowd already. <laughs> a lot of these people kind of join me every time. So they've kind of created their own little community and, and mm -hmm. they say hi to each other. And it's really kind of fun. So Alastair, how long have you been knitting? Um, well, let's see. Uh, about 15, 16 years now. And what, uh, brought, what brought you to knitting? So uh, I was at a craft sharing event in college. I sort of did it by chance. Uh, I was there to teach origami, but uh, nobody came to my origami class, so I sat in on a knitting class. And thank goodness, honestly, because uh, if somebody had come to my origami class, I might not be here now. Um, I, I really sort of fell in love with the, the, the technique. Um, I, I'm mostly self-taught. Uh, this was before the age of uh, easy access to uh, videos online and uh, and I was sort of doing it in a bubble for quite a long time until I found my community um, and so I, I uh, taught myself how to knit uh, after uh, after that quick first lesson. So and the lesson was it just on knitting and purling type thing? It was the literally of just knitting. You know, we just learned the the knit stitch. We made a little garter stitch swatch. A uh, little, my, I remember, my, uh, little tiny red square, not that big. <laughs> my granddaughter Ireland, um, I've taught her how to knit, and uh, well, people will say, "Oh, do you know how to knit?" And she goes, "Yeah, and I know how to purl too." <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Um, how long did it take you after you started knitting before you discovered double knitting? Um, surprisingly, only a couple of years. Uh, and um, I was I was a very adventurous uh, knitter to begin with, and I uh, was originally doing Mobius scarves, um, which for me these are not the cat boardy style ones. These are just uh, little short scarves done. Um, in a single skein of yarn with a reversible stitch pattern and then stitched together with a twist, you know, one end to the other. Uh, and so I found, um, while perusing knitting books uh, uh, at some point, I found 
uh, at my local library the book Reversible Two-Color Knitting by Jane Neighbors, which had the potential for um, adding a second color to my reversible stitch patterns that I was playing with. And so I looked into it, I played with it, and in the appendix of that, I found double knitting. And I just got hooked on the concept. Um, it was a different style of double knitting than I do now, but it was uh, still double knitting, and it gave me the fabric that I that I that I fell in love with. And uh, I haven't found the end of the uh, um, I haven't found the edges yet uh, of, of all the things that I can do with this. So, so it's uh, when I'm teaching people to knit, I've taught a lot of people how to knit, like beginning <clears throat> knitting, as well as a lot of people advanced knitting, and and. Uh, Oftentimes, I'll run across somebody who's never held knitting needles in their hands before and who did mm -hmm. not crochet already. Mm -hmm. And they just pick it up. And they, oh, in, they <laughs> just get it. And I tell mm -hmm. that person, I say, you know what? You've always been a knitter. You just never got to try it before. But you've always been a knitter. That's your right. Bra your brain gets <laughs> it. Your brain understands mm -hmm. the architecture of what you're doing. So, exactly. um so at the timeline now, so you've gotten to where you're getting into double knitting. And then mm -hmm. when did you start thinking about actually designing something or writing a pattern? When did that happen? Well, actually, pretty quickly after I figured out um, double knitting in general, because I didn't find any patterns in it. All I found was these little swatches in the appendix of this book, which, you know, I played with and I, I did some some little swatches, as you do. Uh, but I didn't find any other patterns. But it's fairly obvious um, that you can do any two color chart in double knitting. So I made myself a two-color chart, and the very first thing I ever double-knitted um, was the Corvus. Um, and this is the first design, the first double-knitted piece um, that I ever did. Actually, this is done by a sample knitter. The original one is long gone as a gift. But, Hold on just for a second. I'm having some people are saying there's a sound issue. So can you hear, are you hearing Alistair okay right now? And I'll give you a second um, to respond. There's a slight delay from when we talk and when I see. Um, can you hear Alistair and me okay? Here, I will talk okay, again. Okay, it says Alistair is echoing. I'm not echoing. Is Alistair still echoing? Talk for a bit, Alistair. Am I echoing? Is this echoing? I can switch speakers if that would help. Okay, let's keep... Margo, is, is uh, Alistair echoing for you? We'll just give him a second to respond. Go ahead and talk a little bit more. So that scarf, uh, what happened to your original? You said it's long gone. Um, yeah, the uh, well, I mean, it's it's long gone as I gave it gave it as a gift uh, to my sister, okay. who was a sort of amateur ornithologist at the time. So uh, she loved. Okay, Deborah says now says everything is better now. Okay, great. And can you turn your volume down just a little bit? Do you have control over your volume? I have mine turned up all the way. My mic volume? Yeah. Uh, yeah, one second. I think I can do that. I'll just find out. Oh, they say you're still echoing. I have no idea what causes that. Uh, I'll let the speaker volume down a little bit. Uh, I... Mm -hmm. Okay, I am... I'm, I've locked the speaker and microphone volume down. Okay. Um, is that a little better? Okay. Okay. So, we'll continue on. All right? And if you guys... We're going to have to figure out the microphone issue. Mm. Echo is gone. Okay. So, we're Echo good. Echo is gone? Okay. All right. So, I don't know what that was. I have no idea. We're talking yeah. about... You know, I'm in California, and he is on the East Coast, so... Um, Evelyn says it's corrected now, too. Okay, so whatever it was, okay, it seems great. to be better. <laughs> Yay! Okay, Yay. so you did that scarf, and then did you write it? You designed it. 
right? Yeah. And then yeah. you had someone test knit it. You know what? I didn't because I didn't know anything about uh, designing at that point. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anyone test knit it, but it is just a, a big rectangle. Um, and a lot of people, it, I put it out as a free pattern on Ravelry. Um, because at that point I wasn't really trying to make a, a living at this. Right. And so, um, I, I put it out and people knit it and, um, it seemed to go pretty well. I've made some revisions, but it, it didn't need a lot of changing over the years, um, to be a coherent pattern. So, I, at this point, yes, absolutely. I have people test knit my patterns. Right. And, um, so then what did you do after you submitted that pattern to Ravelry and people started knitting it? Because I know at some point you decided to write a book. <laughs> yeah, well, that was, uh, that was some time later. Um, so basically as I, uh, as I work on any piece, I, I am imagining the next one. I am thinking about uh, um, what am I going to do next? What am I going to, uh, how am I going to push the boundaries next? Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, the next piece that I did after this was um, uh, oh, the second pattern that I ever released um, on Ravelry, and, and this one actually for pay, um, was uh, a significant, um, distance from the two from the uh the the standard two sided um two colored piece that we have here um you can see reversible, this is right. the standard standard reversible right. um teeth right. work that you expect um this the uh the falling blocks hat this is three color double knitting combined with two pattern double knitting for two completely different layers and this was actually the second pattern I ever released uh, in 2005. So you were challenging yourself. I was challenging myself, <laughs> exactly. Um, and I was finding that um, uh, that a lot of the stuff that I was trying out in double knitting, um, especially two pattern and multicolor double knitting, which is the large part of what is in my first book, Extreme Double Knitting, um, uh, that stuff didn't appear to be um, uh, all that well documented or documented at all, especially the multicolor stuff. There were several people who had been playing with, with um, two pattern work, um, uh, and uh, there are several other people designing in it who came up with their own notation methods for it, but there was no standard, and I came up with my own notation method that I think is... Uh, um, uh, better than most. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and my yeah, charting stuff. charting for uh, a, asymmetrical double knitting is mm -hmm. uh, a feat in itself. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So planning for it and then charting it and making it something that people, other people can actually follow um, with uh, relative ease is, is a bit of Okay, a so some people have asked some questions. So, so we don't get too far behind so the questions sure. correlate with the conversation. I'm going to look for these mm -hmm. and ask them takes me a second to okay this is from susan mcbride susan mcbride says i'm teaching myself double knitting and i'm having a lot of trouble with tension particularly the last <laughs> purl stitch in each row is this a normal part of the learning curve thanks yes uh, edges, um, and, and I, I honestly count the second to last or, or, uh, uh, or the stitch after the edge uh, as part of the edge in a way um, because it, it, it is included in the whole tension issue. Um, edges are a challenge in double knitting, and part of the answer to that is practice, practice, practice. Um, it will get better over time. The other part of the answer uh, is, um, you know, we're assuming that you're using a cell edge or something similar to the uh, the edge that I that I use. Um, if you're not using a cell edge, I highly recommend you give it a try. It's not a whole lot more um, uh, labor intensive, but it is uh, a lot cleaner. Um, and then uh, the second stitch in every row uh, after you've done the first 
uh, sorry, the, the second pair in, in every row. After you've done the first pair, you do the second pair, give that pair a little bit of a tug. Um, and what that'll do, it'll snug up your edge and keep it snug. If you just tug the edge itself tight, it is going to give you um, a nice tight edge, and then it'll loosen as soon as you do the next stitch. So do, do the second stitch and tighten that, and it'll tighten up the first stitch, or pair, rather, in this case. So um, I've found I that true in any kind of edge. Like, if mm -hmm. you already have problems with edges, even if you're mm -hmm. not doing double knitting, some people have problems with either their second stitch or the next to the last stitch. It's right. the same issue, just depending on which side of the fabric you're on. Um, right. They're going to have that problem in double knitting, too. But oftentimes, people don't recognize it in their regular knitting. They're used to seeing it. It doesn't stand out to them. But then right. when they go to do the double knitting, it stands out like a neon light. So mm -hmm. it, it is. Um, and I have a video on that, on tidy edge stitches. And it's not about slipping the edges or anything. It has to do with making the stitches and you end up with an accumulation of yarn at the end of the row and it can't go up to the next row, it, it goes down. So it gets stuck in an enlarged stitch there. And it's just the mechanics right. of how you're knitting and there are ways to correct it. As Alice Dare says, you can, on the second stitch, you give it a little bit of a tug. If you tug the very first stitch, what it does is pulls yarn up from the row below and tightens the stitch in the row below and makes it even smaller and then the one above is even larger and it accentuates the problem. So it's an engineering sort of thing. That's a great question. So mm -hmm. there is another one. This is from uh, Margo. She says, can I see the crow scarf again and can I purchase the pattern? Well, yes. T two, two answers to that. Um, here is the crow scarf again, or, or as much of it as you can see in the screen. Uh, here, I'll scroll it for you. <laughs> Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, sucking spaghetti up into your so mouth. <laughs> see, it has, a, it has another crow on the other end. Um, it's called Corvus, um, and uh, it is the first pattern in my book, Extreme Double Knitting, which um, I'll show a picture of here. Right here. This is my new revised edition. Uh, by the way, I got the uh, rights back from the uh, from the publisher a few years back and uh, uh, revised it and re-released it under my own imprint. Um, so uh, all of my stuff at this point is self-published. Um, uh, so that however, pattern's in that book. the thing in the book that you want. It is free on Ravelry. You don't actually have to buy that pattern. But, you know, it is also in the book if you're interested in, uh, in anything else in the book, which I hope you are. And then Bonnie Davis says, do you have your patterns tech edited? I do now, yes. Uh, and so, so some of my original early patterns, they were not tech edited. Um, uh, I do now have them tech edited and, uh, and test knitted um, uh, for the last two books, essentially. Okay, and this is from MK. Question, what was your field of study? In college, I was a studio art major, actually. I was a sculpture um, uh, person, uh, which, when I lost my studio space, um, I, uh, I, I picked up knitting, and this is now my creative outlet. Uh, but you can kind of see where, I, I wouldn't call this kind of knitting sculptural necessarily, but there's a three-dimensionality to it that you uh, don't necessarily immediately see in the re interrelationship of the two layers um, and the, all of the planning that goes into how they uh, how I do what I do with double knitting um, uh, I, I think the, the the skills that I used for that and the skills that I used for sculpture um, are not unrelated <laughs> okay so you came out with your first book and one of the things that you did when you first wrote that book at that time you were knitting, uh, double knitting with twisted stitches. I was, yeah. Um, and that was something that I emphasized quite a bit in my original book, Extreme Double Knitting, which uh, if you if you have ever, if you've not seen it, this is the original version. This is how it originally looked when it came out with Cooperative Press back in uh, uh, 2011. Um, but uh, I emphasized the, um, the twisted stitches in there quite a bit. Um, uh, for a couple of reasons, but um, it was some, it was something that was a, a, a byproduct of the method that I was using to knit, uh, and I didn't really learn to control it 
until later. Um, I did I did know how to control it when I wrote the book. Um, uh, once I understood how to control it, I could um, I could choose to do a stitch twisted or untwisted. Um, and by the way, the way I was doing it has nothing to do with in how you insert the needle. It ha has to do with how the stitch is wrapped. Right. Uh, so it's it's um, uh, it's twisting the stitch you're making rather than twisting the stitch that you are working into. Right. Uh, so uh, when I had a chance to revise the the, the book, I, I de-emphasized it quite a bit. I, I relegated it to the appendix. Um, uh, I find the twisted stitches interesting, and I do like the way that they look. They do significantly change the gauge, and they're not absolutely necessary. Um, I felt like um, after <clears throat> a number of years thinking about this uh, and having written another book, uh, I felt like they're a barrier to entry um, if you have to do your entire piece in twisted stitches in order to make gauge um i feel like a lot of people aren't going to do that <laughs> so right. uh so i rewrote all of my patterns to not use them so do you have any samples have to show from that things. first book do you have samples to show from that first book do you have anything yeah, there sure um i've got a couple so um stuff that was in the first book that uh um, uh, that got replaced with other things. Um, uh, yes, let me do something up here. Hold on a second. So Margo says she, just, she just purchased very big bins of stuff. Not knowing exactly what I was going to be asked about, I didn't unpack everything. Um, but, yeah, here we go. I don't know whether you're going to be able to see this in great detail. Um, uh, on your screen, but this is the original um, falling blocks hat, um, and uh, I'll try to actually show the two pieces next to each other. Show you what was changed. Um, so show, the, the show, show your decreasing too, how it's so beautiful at the top. Yeah, will do absolutely. So I'm going to hold these right up to the screen. Hopefully, you can see this one is um, made in twisted stitches. This one is not. Um, and I'll try to hold this one sort of in the light and we move it around see. so maybe you can see that you can see them. the stitches are closed here and a little open here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure if you're able to see that, but just in case, um, uh, I'll explain it. Um, especially in multicolor double knitting, the reason that I did twisted stitches is because um, in multicolor double knitting, we've got three colors worked at the same time. And that third color, you have a pair of stitches in color A and color B, for example, the A is knitted, the B is purled, the C has to be stranded in between the two layers. Mm -hmm. And so there are strands running inside this work. My thought was if I twisted the stitches, I would end up hiding more strands. Uh, I would end up making fewer holes where if you take the fabric and tug it apart, um, you might see the, uh, uh, the strands in between. Um, I. It was only after I made a few more pieces in multicolor double knitting, uh, and I realized that you really don't see the strands even without uh, uh, even without the twisted stitches. It was it was trying to fix a problem that didn't really exist. Um, but an interesting thing about this is this is in uh, worsted weight Baroque Ultra Alpaca. This is in sport weight Baroque Ultra Alpaca light. Oh, wow. They're exactly the same gauge. Right. I didn't have to redesign it at all. <laughs> right. Um, but um uh you wanted to see the decreases yes. so um what i did change in this hat actually re uh relates to the decreases uh this is the original crown um you can see that the uh um the cubes here change size and um, get smaller and smaller and smaller until um you then just cinch the top now the other layer of this um as you can see is this um uh, Armenian cable motif thing and you can see that up at the top it stops and I go to a color rotated version of the cubes again on the inner layer and that was because I didn't want to figure out how to decrease both of these things at the same time and so this just looks basically very much the same as the other layer. Uh, the colors are rotated but it's not immediately obvious unless you're really looking closely. So this one you can see that the I, I'm 
got the same kind of crown here, but um, with a little more time and uh, a little more designing experience, I figured out how to decrease them both at the same time. That's beautiful. So this is the new version, and uh, and as you can see, it's it's uh, two pattern, three color double netting all the way up. It's top. beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> That's what's fun, you know. And when you figure it out, <laughs> it's very rewarding. Yeah. yeah. So um, several people are talking about they own the books. A couple people have purchased books while they're watching this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's next? What came after that? Well, um, so after uh, um, after this stuff, I was actually working on. Um, uh, I, I had done two pattern double knitting. I had done three color double knitting. I had done um, uh, a little tiny bit of textured double knitting um, using a combination of double knitting and marled stitches, which essentially are you know using two yarns held together um, to knit through a single pair as a sing as if it was a single stitch. Um, and I can show what that what I mean by that in a minute. But um, I had started working on. Um, increases and decreases, uh, what I now call off-the-grid double knitting. And um, the reason I call it off-the-grid double knitting is because the charts for it um, are very, very strange uh, and don't, it, it's very hard to, ex, uh, hard to express the chart, uh, hard to express the fabric in a chart that it actually looks like the fabric. Um, and so I, um, uh, I was working on the predecessor to this piece, the Victorian yes, Raffia gorgeous. scarf. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, and uh, this is actually based on a pattern by Kieran Foley. Um, and uh, it's not exactly the same in his, as his, and is exact, it is, of course, double knitted, um, unlike his original one, which was done for stranded knitting. But it is a, um, uh, a piece that was really sort of a practice piece for me for increasing and decreasing. I had done plenty of decreases because I've done a fair number of hats, increasing, uh, and especially decorative, uh, increasing and decreasing, using the increases and decreases to move the stitches around rather than to shape a piece. Um, that was something that, uh, that I was just trying to get a lot of practice in on, and that was what this piece was for. Um, I wrote to Kieran and said, hey, would, would you allow me to put this in my book, which was going to be coming out relatively soon at that point. Um, and he wrote back and said, no. <laughs> so um, so it didn't get in the book, and that was actually a, a, a mixed blessing, um, because I, I don't think that I would have had the time to get it into the book, um, because it was, only, it was about two-thirds finished, and I would have still need to pho photograph it and write it up and everything. Right. Um, but... The reason I mention this is that I was at a guild event, uh, at a guild that uh, some friends of mine and I founded here in Boston, it's now, now defunct, um, that um, uh, Shannon Oki was there speaking about um, uh, publishing and independent publishing, uh, um, and she was watching me knit this thing um, at our dinner. Uh, after the after the guild event, and uh, and she said, "You have to write a book for me." <laughs> um, and it was at that point I had already been thinking about writing a book, you know, a few years for a few years, but I didn't really know where to start. And um, I uh, I had been um, I, I I think at that point I would have been unready for it. Um, uh, and so it was a good thing that I waited a few more years until I was really ready to do it uh, and had a, a, a better body of knowledge for it um, and, and, and more experience. Isn't it amazing how the knowledge of knitting just goes on and on and mm -hmm. on and on and there's yeah. never an end to it. It never, yeah. ever, to me, it never gets boring. Never. Yes. I'm constantly yeah, challenging myself. You always find myself. something new and yes. interesting to do with it. Exactly, exactly. So um, let's see. There, I think there was another question here. This is from Margot. She says, and it's a good question. She says, what level would you recommend a knitter need to be to attempt double knitting? Um, 
So really all you need to know how to do is knit and purl. Um, I, uh, Suzanne said to me earlier while we were chatting before this that she considers double knitting um, uh, one, of the, one of the hardest versions of color work. And I, I, I respectfully disagree. I think brioche is harder. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but, um, uh, but this uses the same terminology. Uh, it doesn't have all the new terminology that, that brioche uses. Um, this is just knits and pearls. Now, getting it done cleanly, yes, is difficult. <laughs> um, but getting the basic technique down is really the, the motions are very much like one by one ribbing. So if you can knit one pearl, one knit one pearl, one knit one pearl, one, you've got a good leg up on this. <laughs> um, now, then you have to figure out how to hold both yarns at the same time. And yes, there is a learning curve. And yes, there is muscle memory that you will need to generate over time to make it really feel natural. But all you really need to know how to do is knit and pearl. Um, so try it, you know. Uh, it's, it's not going to hurt to do a little swatch, a little sample, um, and if you like it, you know, cast on something simple. There are plenty of, uh, of intro-level simple patterns in double knitting out there. So um, Some from me, many from other people. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, when, when we were talking about the difficulty of it, I consider it difficult because it, of the tension issues that right, you can sure. encounter. And one of the mm -hmm. questions someone asked on Ravelry was about that, not the edge stitches, but the tension mm -hmm. within the work. So yeah. uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, a few things about that. First of all, um, uh, flat double knitting um, is generally a good place to start because you, uh, even though in some ways it's a little more complex, uh, you're alternating the uh, knit rows and purl rows on both layers. So essentially you're doing um, in any given row a layer of stockinette and a layer of reverse stockinette, right? So that you have, if you flip it over, a uh, uh, two layers of stockinette facing outwards. And when, you, when you turn it over and do the next row, the row that you had been doing as reverse stockinette becomes your stockinette row, and the row that you had been doing as stockinette becomes your reverse stockinette row. And so essentially, um, you're alternating your knits and purls the same way you would be doing, uh, you know, row row by row, the same way you would be doing it in um, uh, single layer knitting, uh, which means that um, the overall gauge of the piece will tend to equalize. Um, uh, the other, the the flip side of this is that if you did it in the round. Um, all of your knits on one layer would always be done as knits, and all um, and all of the knits on the other layer would always be done as purls. Which means that if you have a significant difference between your knit and your purl gauges, um, your inner layer is likely to be larger, a little bit larger, <laughs> um, than your outer layer. Now, of course, you can just turn it inside out, and that solves itself to some degree. Right. Um, but uh, um, the other thing, the other way that uh, that I recommend people deal with these tension differences is um, just do a lot of color work. Like every right. time the colors link together, um, or every, every time the colors change, it links the fabric together. The more color work you have, the more stable your fabric it is, and the less you're likely to see those um, those knit and purl differences. Now, that's of course, you know, where you begin. The more you do this very likely the more your knit and pearl tension will get closer to, to each other. And this is again a practice thing. The more you do it, the more even your double knitting will get. Right. Um, and, but those are a few things to, to help you in the meantime right. feel better about the fabric. So uh, this is Vi EVX and she says her question, do you have any tips how to make double knitting a bit easier? And I know that's kind of what you just talked about. But mm -hmm. can you discuss a little bit of the other technique of double knitting where you just use one color at a time? Sure. Now, this is the slip stitch method is something that uh, I I started out with that as well. Um, I started out uh, learning the slip stitch method. That was what was in the appendix of uh, reversible two color knitting. I believe I mentioned earlier. Um, 
and that uh, um, that method allows you to do um, many things that in, in double knitting. Not everything that, that I have figured out how to do can be done in slip stitches, but um, you can get away with uh, regular um, color work motif double knitting and two pattern double knitting in slip stitch uh, at the very least. Slip stitch double knitting gets you the same kind of fabric, but it only requires that you use one yarn at a time. But every row is done twice. Every row is done in two passes because you still need both colors in each row. So, so basically it, what you're doing is you're knitting the stitches that require that color and slipping yeah, and all slipping the other the stitches. Others. But if that stitch needs to be a purl stitch, like if it's a design on the other side in that color, you would go ahead and purl that stitch. Right. You would just work all the stitches requiring that color, whether they're knits or purls, and mm -hmm. slip all the other stitches till you get to the right. end of the row. And then you would come back to the beginning of the row again. This is why you need to use double pointed needles and work the second color, work all of its required stitches, slipping the stitches that were worked in the first color. Yes. So that's what's it's slip yeah. stitch right. double knitting. Right. So essentially you have two types of pair instead of um, knit one in A, purl one in B, like you have uh, in, in standard double knitting, A, B pairs or B, A pairs. You have um, uh, knit one, slip one, or slip one, purl one pairs. Right. Um, and then you, you just, you typically will go across with one and then back in the other direction with the, uh, with the other, uh, and then switch that each time. Right. Okay, Leslie asks, Suzanne said that you're on the East Coast. I just moved to North Carolina. What events do you do go to either as a guest or as a teacher? Um, so I teach all over the country. Um, I don't believe I'm doing anything in the South right now, but um, I do. I did get to um, Stitches United last year, which was in Georgia. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll give you my, my schedule coming up. I'll be at um, Red Alder, uh, which is in, which is the, the new Madrona, is in Tacoma, Washington. Um, the uh, next one after that, I believe, is Stitches United, um, but is in Hartford. They're bouncing back and forth between Hartford, Connecticut and Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I don't know how long that's going to be going on, but if I'm there again, it'll be next year. Um, uh, Interweave Yarn Fest. Oh, um, I forget which is first. Uh, DFW Fiber Fest, Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, um, and Interweave Yarn Fest in Colorado. I don't remember which one of them is first, but uh, those are the big shows that I'm going to be at, that I'm scheduled to be at this year. And the Dallas Fort Worth one also has the Master's Day there every year for the people who are working in the Master Hand Knitting program. That's an excellent mm -hmm. day to go to. So you could see Alistair and do the Master Hand Knitting thing at the same mm -hmm. function. <laughs> now, you also teach at retreats, right? And special functions? Yep. Yep. I'm not booked at any right now, but uh, it's absolutely something I have done. Uh, that's where we met. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, at, at a retreat. So, um, but. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I do local shops, I do retreats, I do the big shows. Wherever people want me to come, I'm willing to entertain the possibility. And we, we'll talk about how people can contact you in, towards the end of this, and you can give your contact information if you want. Sure, sure, yeah. Okay, so uh, Serena asks, are you a continental knitter? <laughs> so that's a tough question. I'm not actually a, um, I, I'm not actually a knitter of a style that, has a name. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's a left-hand wrap. My style is a left-hand wrap, and it comes from being self-taught. Uh, I figured out how to knit basically on my own, how to hold the yarn on my own, and I experimented with it and played with it until I found a way that worked for me. I got stitches that uh, were were correct, <laughs> um, I, but it doesn't look like the normal styles of knitting. Um, however, I, I credit that style that I've figured out on my own with uh, the ease with which I can do multicolor double knitting um, and double knitting in general. I don't have to worry um, about how I how many strands of yarn I hold in my hand. Um, 
it all works pretty much the same regardless of the number of strands. One, two, three, five, it makes no difference. So it's it's whatever works for each individual person. Yeah. It's personal preference how you want to hold your yarns. It's not how you hold your yarns that really makes the double knitting. It's how you make the stitches and, and which color you use for which stitch. So, yeah, when I teach my classes, I don't I don't tell people you must knit in this particular way. Everybody comes in with their own knowledge and their own um, method of knitting. I try not to require that anyone relearn how to knit just so that they can double knit. If you do it continental, you do it English, you do it with a Norwegian pearl, you do Portuguese, anything. Right. It works. You can make right. it work. Right. If you can make knit stitches and pearl stitches, you can make it work. Yep. Yep. So this is from Margo again. She says, so DPNs are needed because I use the word DPN. Circulars are also fine. <laughs> I use circulars for pretty much everything. So and circulars are just DPNs with a cable in the middle. Long DPNs, yeah, exactly. It's a long DPN. DPNs are not absolutely necessary. Okay, um, Demetria wants to know if you're going to be at SAF, S A F F. I am not going to be at SAF, and as a matter of fact, I've never been to SAF. Um, I would love to go to SAF. If you would like to get somebody from SAF in touch with me, um, do it, <laughs> um, and I'd be happy to talk to them about it. I, I, um, I, it, it's an event I've heard about, but it's not one I've been to. So. Okay, and this is from, I'm open to whatever, though. <laughs> maybe somebody will invite you. This is from Deborah yeah. Cisneros. She says, so then did knitting backwards develop from double knitting? Not that I'm aware of, no. And as a matter of fact, you don't have to knit backwards in double knitting at any point. Um, you just flip it over like you would for any other piece. Um, now, that's not to say that you can't knit backwards in double knitting. In order to do double knit entrelock, it kind of helps. Wow. But... Oh, my God. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so Lori Jane says she'll see you at Dallas-Fort Worth. Yay. Dolise Beeman wants to know, she said, does Alistair have a pattern that features the slip stitch double knitting? I don't. Um, it's not a technique that I... I uh, use very much anymore. It's in the appendix of my book, Extreme Double Knitting. So if you'd like to learn the technique, it's in the book, um, but it doesn't have any patterns that support it at the moment. Um, uh, it's an older method of double knitting and it isn't nearly as flexible. And I don't mean the fabric, I mean that the technique doesn't allow you to do as many things with it. And so I feel like it's sort of a, uh, um, uh, I don't want to say a regression because I know there's still people that use it and prefer to only have one um, uh, one color at a time to deal with, um, but it takes longer to do because you have to do every row twice. Um, well, it's it's very similar to mosaic knitting in that sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it's not the only style that does a two a two pass thing. Right, um, right. Or brioche, okay. brioche right. does two pass for each row yeah, also. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, but of course it is, it is different. And uh, um, I'm not aware of a lot of other patterns that use it. Um, I, the, the, what I call the modern method, the method that I use now, um, was developed sometime in the 80s as far as I can tell. Um, uh, at least the method that um, uses it for color work. So I'm gonna, show, um, I'm gonna show my references now that I showed you yeah, before. Yeah, yeah, go for it. So the thing about double knitting is there is not a lot of resource material available. Um, if you try to do research on double knitting, there, there's just a few books, just a few references versus Fair Isle or Stranded Knitting or uh, any other type of color work. There's, you can have an entire library on each of those topics. So this is, this is the earliest one that I have found. And this is a Beverly Royce and it's called Double Knitting. Notes on Note, Double notes Knitting. On double knitting. Yep. Mm -hmm. And this one came out in 1981. That's the earliest information that I have found on double knitting. Now, I don't believe she does two color double knitting. It's all more about just double knitting. Okay. I think there's a little bit of it at the end in right, the expanded right. edition only. Then the next in the sequence of a timeline, this is Marianne, Marianne Isiger. And this is knitting out of Africa, and she just she has a lot of different color work techniques in here, but she has an entire section at the back of the book on double knitting. And she, what's interesting about this is she addresses um, joining double knit fabrics together, increases and decreases in shaping, because the two projects that she has in this book that 
require the double knitting are vests. There's the two projects. And so um, she's talking about garments in double knitting and they're completely reversible. So the seams are reversible too, which is very, very cool. Then this is the next book. And a lot of people have seen this one, Imlu Baber. How do you say? Yeah. Faber? Faber? It's double knitting, and this came out in 2008, reversible, and uh, two color designs. And so you can see her coat on the color cover here. It's, it's, uh, this is an excellent, excellent book also. Garments, though. It's all garments. This is another one by Marianne Issiger, Inca Knits. And this one came out in 2009. And again, she has several garments. She has this jacket. It's completely double knit, but she talks about seaming and increases and decreases and shaping for a garment, which is very interesting. And you don't, the, her books are the only ones, well, the Imlu Bob Baber book has the shaping too. Then this one came out originally in Germany in 2011 and then was produced in the United States in English in 2014. And then Alastair. And this is, uh, his first book came out in 2000, what year did your first one come out? This is 2011, yeah. Yeah, this one is, so, this is no, his, this, this is his next one. 2018. Yes, this is the next uh, one. 2016 book. Yes, this yeah. is the 2016 book, which he hasn't talked about yet. Um, <laughs> and, and then he has a new book after that. So let's go on and move to this book. Sure. Okay. So, um, Double or Nothing, um, so after I did Extreme Double Knitting, so this is the 2011 one, to continue with your bibliography here, this is the 2011 version. Um, uh, after that, um, it, was, it was another, you know, few years before I started thinking about where I was going to go next. And um, when I designed the new book, Double or Nothing, um, uh, I didn't want people to have to have extreme double knitting and have to know extreme double knitting before they uh, they got that book. And so I took all of the the content, um, the uh, um, the technique content in extreme double knitting, obviously not the patterns, and crammed it down into uh, two or three chapters in um, in Double or Nothing. And I, I did give patterns to, to uh, just a, f a few patterns, a handful of patterns, um, to uh, use those original techniques that were originally in extreme double knitting. Um, and then I jumped off the deep end. <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, um, extreme double knitting, I, what I tell people when they're asking me, which one of these should I get for my skill level? Um, and I say they both start at the same place. It really depends on how adventurous of a knitter you are. Um, the learning curve in double knitting is steeper simply because it goes to uh, more extremes. Um, uh, it goes out all the way up to um, uh, double knit lace, double knit cables, uh, double knit intarsia, double knit entrelock, and double knit textures in addition to the two pattern and multicolor stuff that I was doing in extreme double knitting. Um, and it, uh, it does have of course, the basic stuff. It starts you off the basics. It gives you a pattern to do with the basics. Um, it gives you a few new techniques that were also in extreme double knitting. Um, there's a, a little bit of multicolor double knitting in there. Um, there's a very small amount of two pattern double knitting. I felt like I covered those pretty well in extreme double Hold knitting. Hold the book up again. Um, hmm? Hold your book up again. Oh, uh, the this one? Yes. Yeah. So, um, so one of the things that I like to do in my books actually is um, I like to give it a, do a pattern browser. So this actually, uh, um, aside from the the, the regular um, uh, table of contents, this is just a a uh, a little shot of each pattern and what page it's on. So uh, you can see the variety of uh, variety of patterns we have here. Um, uh, so it's. Um, <clears throat> it's still got quite a number of patterns. I think there are 14 patterns in either in either book, but Double or Nothing goes further into uh, the, the the possibilities of the technique, which you would you would expect given that it came out five years later. And of course, I've continued to develop the technique and um, and figure out what else can be done with it. Okay, and so then after that, you have your third book, right? 
Well, it isn't actually a third book. It's, it's actually the same. Um, well, okay, that's not exactly the case. I have Parallax, which yes. isn't, uh, it, it's a booklet. It's, it's not very right. thick. Um, and, but it's got five patterns in it on, on this op art technique, um, which uh, here is one. This is Parallax 2.0. Show you a little piece of it. Uh, this one's done on the bias, so it's a, um, a really basically just standard double knitting with an increase on one edge and a decrease on the other for every other row. Um, so it's not terribly, terribly difficult, but um, the increasing portion of it is, is especially weird because you have to continue the pattern with the increases. So you have to make sure you're increasing in the right color. Um, so, and that's uh, the two color version, right? Yeah, and then I've got a three-color version, Parallax 3.0, which uh, which uses three colors and the th three gradients, which makes it for makes for a really interesting, uh, uh, really interesting look. Now the, this book came out. Um, here's look at that! Oh my, I love that so much. Yeah, definitely one of my favorites. And uh, you know, if you'd like to see something really neat, I'll show you 3.5. Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, 3.5 is um, not out as a pattern and probably never will be. Um, hold on one moment. There it is. Wow. Oh, 3.5. Yes. Um, so this is uh, taking that three color idea to some really weird extremes. Um, and uh, it is. Look at that. Wow. Ten feet long. <laughs> um, because I just, I loved it so much. I didn't want to stop. It's so psychedelic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that so. is awesome. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Parallax uh, is a collection of that op art style. Uh, the first three patterns in there are actually beginner level patterns. Um, and as a matter of fact, like this is Parallax 0 0.5. This is easier to do than the Corvus scarf, by the way, um, because once you set up the color changes at the very beginning, they're in exactly the same place every row beyond that. <laughs> right, just the number of rows changes. Yeah, yeah, you just Not have to keep a certain stitches. numerical progression in mind, but if you can count to four, you can do it. So um, let's go back to that uh, Ontrelock piece that you held up a minute ago. Sure. That's gorgeous. So this, is, this is definitely one of the more extreme pieces in um, in Double or Nothing. Uh, it takes an entire chapter to explain how to do this. So it'll probably never come out as a, a standalone pattern. Mm -hmm. Some of these will eventually get split off into individual patterns. Uh, but that's a big project, and I just haven't gotten around to it. This right. one probably never will be. It's always going to be just in that book because it takes so much documentation to explain how to do all of the various things. But you've already got it written up. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, in, so, it's in Double yeah, Nothing. But what's cool, what I love about Ravelry, and I guess it also the uh, love, uh, love craft knitting or whatever, the, mm -hmm. is yep. that you know, it doesn't matter how big the PDF is. You can write as much right, as you right, want. Exactly. It's not I mean, like you're publishing. Limits, but, uh, <laughs> you're not publishing in a magazine that has limited space. You can write as right. much as you want. So right. there's some more questions right. here now. Um, Serena wants to know: Is there a recommended uh, yarn weight for double knitting, or a type of fiber? Good questions. Um, so yarn weight is the easy question to answer. Um, Keep in mind that everything you do is going to be twice as thick as it would be if you were doing it in single layer knitting. So if you do a double knit piece in worsted weight yarn, you are going to end up with something that's sort of on the bulky side of things. Um, if you want something, if you want a fabric that is similar to uh, worsted weight fabric in single layer knitting, you're going to probably want to use sport weight yarn to do that. And that's actually something that I did in um, the revised edition of Extreme Double Knitting. Um, I, I I took some of the hats that I had done, um, especially hats. Uh, I think there may have been one other piece um, I did in worsted weight yarn and oh uh, yeah, a, a baby blanket. I I, I redid um, uh, several hats and a baby blanket um, in sport weight yarn rather than worsted weight yarn because. Um, they're just more wearable that way. Not the baby blanket, obviously. It's, it's, um, I just wanted to redesign that one for other reasons, and sport weight yarn simply makes a nicer fabric for that. So, um, 
So anyway, I love working in sport and fingering. Um, I don't generally go with anything thicker than a DK weight these days, although sometimes I will use a worsted weight, um, uh, but only for something that doesn't that isn't fitted, um, something that's going to drape. Right. Um, uh, because if it's fitted, it's just going to be cloying. It's going to be too. It's going to be uh, too warm. Like no matter a jacket. What It'll be a jacket Unless or a coat. in the Antarctic, in which case maybe it's okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> With the climate change, you know, you might need it. But um, right, right. Also, speaking of. Oh, that, and then to, to finish the answer on, on fiber content, yes, because yes. that was that was the other half of it. Um, I generally try to stick to wool and wool blends or animal fiber and animal, animal fiber blends. Um, I try not to do anything that has a lot of aura to it, so I stay away from mohair um, uh, and things like that. Um, I, but I've worked in lots of wools and wool blends, lots of alpaca blends, and lots of cashmere blends. Um, uh, cotton and linen and flax and things like that just don't have enough memory. You stretch it out and it stays stretched. Um, this is very springy work. Um, and it has a nice, uh, a nice spring to it on its own, but it will not spring back um, if it, if you, uh, if you use certain plant fibers. Acrylic's also fine, you know. Much as I, much as I uh, uh, don't super enjoy working in acrylic, acrylic uh, works fine in this stuff. Right. So, so also uh, something else that applies to double knitting is the needle size. You yes. wouldn't use the same needle size that you would use in non-double knitting, correct? You might or might not. I mean, everybody's gauge is different, but yes, it's fairly common that people need to go down a needle size or two in, in double knitting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I teach my classes, my intro classes, I generally recommend that people use whatever needle size they're already familiar with because that will help them understand how they might how their gauge changes in double knitting. Mm -hmm. um, so if they find that it's fine, great. Uh, but if they find that it's getting a little loose, then maybe when they do another swatch or the next piece that they do, um, they're going to want to go down a needle size or two to tighten up those stitches and, and get a gauge that's closer to what their single layer knitting gauge Get a be. better fabric. Yeah. So Leslie has another question. She says, um, everything I've seen with double knitting produces stockinette fabric on both sides. Is it possible to include texture in double knitting as well? Absolutely. Um, and I have a lovely piece here called Hexworth. Um, it uses a honeycomb stitch. You can see that we've got stockinette on the background, and then um, the honeycomb portions of it are in pearls. Uh, there's the reverse of that. Um, Very pretty. Uh, and I've got another one, but actually this is an easier, easy, more easily accessed one. Um, this is called Heartbound Again. It's double knit cables. You can see that the cables are, are traveling along a pearl side background. That's um, gorgeous. And uh, I and love the, the color combinations. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of it's a little bit subtle, but also in the right it's light. It's pretty vibrant. vibrant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, but but yeah, uh, you can absolutely do pearl side out. Um, uh, there are some limitations with that. You don't want to go straight from the cast on into reverse double knitting, which is what I call this. Um, uh, it looks terrible. Um, but if you can, if you have a way of uh, of transitioning from the cast on uh, and standard double knitting um, with stockinette out into the uh, the pearl side out version, that will help you along. Okay, Margo has another question. She says, does Alistair have a YouTube channel or videos elsewhere? Yes. And, and yes, and we'll link those down below this in the description awesome. of this. Yes. Thanks. The YouTube channel is not super well um, filled out at the moment, um, but please subscribe to it. Uh, I will be adding more videos in the future. I've taken a lot of footage while I was doing these two books. I just haven't had chance time. to get on to actually editing it yeah it's time <laughs> it's called time there's not enough yeah, time exactly. okay evelyn wants to know if you could show a double knit lace uh piece totally um i have one gigantic one right here on my desk let me just toss some of these other pieces down underneath to make room for it <clears throat> this is called a denive it is um 
a seven and a half foot wide double knit lace shawl. Um, I'm only obviously showing you a little piece of it right here because it's huge and I can't back up far enough from where I'm sitting to actually show you the whole thing. But as you can see, it's a... Uh... Wow, beautiful. Uh, starts off with what would normally be a garter tab, um, but it's a double knit tab um, here in this case. Um, and, uh, and grows out from there. Um, and I will, there we go, show you. It goes down to these points at the bottom. Um, it's supposed to look like wings. And uh, beautiful. As much of it as I can show you right there. Yeah. Um, and I'll flip it over, of course. So this is really the only practical way that you can do color work in lace. Um, I mean, if you want to do uh, panels of uh, different color with lace in them, that's one thing. But if you want to actually put color work in your lace, um, it's pretty difficult to do that any other way. Um, the neat thing about double knitting is that anytime you're using color A on one layer, you're using color B on the other. And, uh, and so there's no stranding going on at any point. Um, and unless you're working in multicolor double knitting, which I wouldn't recommend for lace. <laughs> um, so uh, this means that you can sort of drop in chunks of color wherever it makes sense. And uh, um, this is one possible uh, um, way of doing that. I've got uh, another piece um, down here somewhere um, that uh, uses it rather differently. Um, and this piece is getting, about to get redone. I've got the yarn and everything. I just don't have the time. But you can see that in oh, this piece, it's really called Spring Willow. Um, I've just picked out pieces of the, uh, it's upside down, there we go, <laughs> um, picked out pieces of the, uh, uh, of the stitches, of uh, the stitch pattern, and just emphasized them in with the color change. Oh, that is beautiful. beautiful. Thank you. Okay. And those are both in double or nothing. Spring Willow is available as a standalone pattern because it came, it was one of the patterns that came out before. And we can, we can link your Ravelry uh, designer page down below. Sure. So yeah. So Marlene Kern has a question. She says, is there a difference between double knitting and reversible knitting? If so, please explain the difference. Well, double knitting is a kind of reversible knitting. Uh, uh, there are many other kinds of knitting that are or can be reversible. Um, but uh, um, I mean, brioche is reversible. Several knit pearl patterns are, are, uh, are reversible. Um, uh, but I would say it's it's a type of reversible knitting. That's that's really all I it's can say. It's a subset. About. It's a subset. It's like Fair yeah, Isle exactly. is a subset of stranded knitting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So have we covered everything you wanted to show? I had mentioned to you before to maybe if you had any bloopers or things that you had tried that didn't work out. I unfortunately was not able to get to the storage <laughs> unit today to pick it up. I'm okay. sorry. That's okay. Um, I just. Um, I've got a house guest staying with me, and I had to move a bunch of my stash um, <laughs> to make room for her <laughs> and her stuff. Um, and so, um, I uh, um, uh, one of the things that I moved was my bin full of um, uh, my. You can think of them as sketches, almost the things that I was uh, I was testing a technique and testing how something re uh, interrelated. Um, uh, there's a whole bag in there full of hat crowns. It's just the crowns. So they're basically a bunch of little discs or yarmulke-like things um, uh, because I'm working on how, to, how the crown works, but I don't really need to know how the rest of the hat works in order so to do that. It's called so, swatching. You swatch. Yeah, exactly. They're yeah. just swatches. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't get to Oh, that's out. okay. Um, I do, however, have something new to show if you'd like to oh, see yes, something yes, that yes, I haven't yes. published yet. Yes, um, let's see it. It will be coming out soon. Um, so I'm working on a new set of patterns um, that are, uh, it's a, a series of five hats um, in um, uh, the Chinese five elements. Uh, so it's uh, earth, and I'm going to do them in the wrong order, but earth, water, fire, wood, and metal. Um, and so this is fire. This is the first one I designed. I designed it quite a while ago, and then the yarn was discontinued, and it's sort of sat for a while without me doing anything with it. Um, but you can see as I'm as I'm turning it around, there are little bits that sparkle. 
It's because it has beads in it. Oh, how cool. So, um, and the other side has different beads in it. Wow, beautiful. Um, so um, I'm going to be putting out a, uh, a series of these. Very likely they're, kind of, they're only going to come out uh, digitally, at least initially, unless there's a lot of interest, in which case I might at some point print them. But um, very likely what's going to happen is um, I'm going to uh, sort of pre-sell the collection and add in the patterns as they're finished. Right. Um, and uh, so I have uh, fire done and I have earth done. Um, where is it? Now, do you generally always knit your hats from the brim up so you're doing decreases or have Sorry, you ever started again? at the crown? What was that again? Do you generally always knit your hats from the brim up with decreases yeah. at the crown, or have you ever started at the crown and used increases? Um, I haven't, but that is one of the things that's going to happen with um, one of these hats. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, so this this by the way is is earth. Um, oh wow! It's hard to see all with the of pearl it, stitches. See. Oh, that's it's gorgeous. Um, uh, leaf pattern. Uh, it's incredibly complex. Um, so <laughs> essentially, what I'm doing, and you can see that the the two um, the two techniques side by side. Um, uh, you can see one of them has a leaf motif in it, um, and one of them has this fire motif in it. They're both the same shape. They're just using col the color work uh, in a different way. Um, we're using uh, uh, heavy increases along the bottom to make this sort of almost semicircular mm -hmm. pattern along the bottom, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, slower decreases uh, to close it off to make this sort of teardrop shape. And that shape is going to show up in all five hats in a different way. In wood, it's going to show up as knot holes. Um, in, uh, in this, it's going to show, it's showing up as leaves. In water, it's going to show up as water droplets. And in metal, it's actually going to show up as uh, metal droplets. Um, uh, and um, it's actually going to be, and this is the most bizarre thing, um, a hat that's made from both brim and crown. So it's going to start off at the top, um, and a separate piece is going to start off from the bottom, and they'll be kitchener together in, in the middle somewhere. Um, and that'll allow me to make these water droplets run in both directions. So it'll be sort of a thing. I don't know. It's conceptual at the moment. Um, <laughs> basically, I'm taking that that uh, that shape, and I'm applying it to all five hats in different ways. It's very so, cool. So do you yeah. dream? Do you dream about knitting? Sometimes, yeah, especially when I'm in super creative mode, um, when I'm doing a lot of uh, a lot of designing rather than you know, a lot of writing down the designs. But when I'm actually in the, the deep creative mode, yeah, it definitely comes up in my dreams. <laughs> For me, sometimes uh, I'm not really a designer. I'm an I'm an executioner. I don't kill people, but mm -hmm. I, I I I like the engineering <laughs> aspect of knitting and. Um, the things that I do design are usually just as teaching modules to learn the concept that I'm trying to teach. Right. But I'll often uh, think about it for quite some time before I actually knit it. And, mm -hmm. and then by the time I knit it, I've pretty much got it figured out. But then I've right. got to remember to write it down. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> because you get so involved in the knitting of it and seeing how it's turning out. But then also what happens is you change your mind. Say, oh, well, yeah. maybe if I do it this way instead of that way. And then when you go to write it down, you go, now, which way did I do it? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I'm going to have to, when I write this beaded one down, I'm going to have to take a bunch of photos of how the beading happens. Right. Because that's a whole new thing. Um, right. So it's going to be interesting. Okay, so um, I think that we've covered just about everything, unless you don't, you have anything else to cover that you want to say? Oh, goodness, there's so much more that I could cover, but I think we're doing yeah, pretty I well. Think we can, <laughs> we can. It's been really fun, and I know everybody really loves seeing your creative process and all of the knitting and what you've done and how you've worked through it. It's, it's just mm -hmm. very, very amazing. Um, and I'm, I want to be, uh, I'm very thankful that you agreed to do this today. I know everybody's very, it's a learning process for everybody. It's very, very sure. fun. And so, yeah, well, I just love, I love to show people what's possible. 
and I want to remind everybody that you don't have to start by jumping into one of these, you know, crazy lace things, um, or double knit cables, or double knit entrelock, or whatever. Um, you you start at the basics and you build up, just you like can, you do with anything else. You can do the you start at the basics, you build yourself a nice foundation, and then bird on it. take it as far as you can go. Yep. Yep. So Evelyn says swatch that word again. Yes, there's lots yes, of swatching. No. It all starts with swatching. So mm -hmm. these things are baby swatches that grow into these finished projects. Okay, so yeah. I'm going to let you go. And I'm so glad that you were on here and joined us. And it was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Suzanne. I'm glad you've done it. And I'll put all the links down below the video so you can everybody can find uh, Alistair's uh, materials, his Ravelry page, his books. Is, uh, yeah, I sell my books on my website. You can also find them on Amazon. If you get them on my website, you get them with a free PDF download. You get them on Amazon. You don't. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I and also if you uh, um, if you've got a local yarn shop somewhere that uh, wants to stock them, get them in touch with me. I or if they want to get in touch with you to teach a class or a retreat. Or yeah, absolutely. Yes. If you yes. if you've got anyone in your area that uh, you want. Um, you want me to come to and uh, teach a class? If you got a guild, a local shop, a big, uh, you know, a fiber show, a fiber festival of some kind that I haven't been to, um, absolutely get them with me. We can talk and uh, maybe and figure something out. I've taken a, a one class from Alistair at Stitches, and then he came and did a retreat for our guild. And I will tell you, he is an excellent, excellent teacher. He's very calm, patient. He'll repeat things over and over until you get it. He has a great uh, presentation for overhead display, for showing his hands mm -hmm. up on the screen. Uh, he's a very, very good teacher, and I highly recommend him. Okay. Thanks so much. Take care. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.